The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is the fifth day of this seven day sashin here at Mountain Gate in Northern New Mexico on a chilly day in fall, uh, September um, 2021. Uh, it is becoming clear that winter is coming. We've passed the equinox, the, the fall equinox. And uh, this morning for the first time, things were colder and they will continue to get colder and colder and colder. Things change, things change. And it is in, enlivening that things change. We would be so bored and so dull if things didn't change. But then we have the challenge of letting go of, of when we don't want things to change, and they do anyway, or when we do want them to, and they don't yet. And that's a wonderful venue for practice. I'd like to share with you today um, something I already read in the Sashin, but I'll go in, in greater depth into it. This is from a book called Luminous Mind, The Way of the Buddha. And these are the teachings of Kalu Rinpoche. Kalu Rinpoche um, was a, a foremost teacher in the Kagyu sect of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And he used to come to Santa Fe. And in fact, it was kind of wonderful because uh, when we lived in Santa Fe back in the early 1980s, his group uh, was right down the street from us in a simple little compound uh, headed by a Lama who had been born and raised in Bhutan, I think it was, Lama Dorje. And we used to wander down, down the block and, and hang out sometimes with them. And it was kind of uh, a nice feeling to have that extended Sangha family right there. In Rochester, particularly in the 1970s, um, it, it was the only show in town. And in fact, in the United States, uh, there wasn't much else. Uh, there was the San Francisco Zen Center on the West Coast. There was Zen Center of Los Angeles on the West Coast. Uh, somewhere in there came Daiwosatsu in New York State. And um, there was a, a man up in Maine, I think it was, who was something of Rinzai teacher. And that was it. That, those were the options other than uh, some ethnic temples. There was later in Rochester, there was a, um, I think it was a Cambodian Buddhist temple. And gradually Buddhism expanded and grew in the United States, both in the, the Tibetan uh, sector and in the Zen sector, both in Japanese Zen and in uh, Korean Son and in Chinese Chan temples. And now there are many, many different options for practice in Buddhism in the United States and uh, certainly less uh, available in Japan. Once Haruroshi um, is gone, uh, although he is working very, very hard on uh, raising, as it's termed, uh, disciples to become successors. Uh, I don't know yet of any that are, are actually ready to, to take over. There is one young Japanese man who happens to be fluent in English, who has his own family temple and uh, it's possible that he may also end up abbot of Sogenji. It's hard to know. But Zen in Japan is, is fading and has faded for a long, long time. The uh, basically pogrom that took place as part of the Meiji Restoration 
really took a bite out of Japanese and Buddhism. But still, there were some temples that were uh, serious teaching temples, but most of those teachers have died. Yeah. The teacher who was, uh, who took over uh, out of the Dayun Sokaku temple um, and actually was kicked out of Hoshinji by the Soto sect who didn't want any taint of Rinzai sect uh, teachings in that temple. Um, took over uh, a small temple called Bukkokuji, and that was Tongan Roshi. But he died some years back, and before he died, he, he, was, um, uh, he fell victim to Alzheimer's. So he was gone. Uh, the Soto sect teacher who took over Hosh Hoshinji uh, seems to have been a, a, a serious teacher, but he is I'm not even sure he's still alive. And there really aren't other teachers beyond uh, Harada Shodoroshi at Sogenji who are deeply serious, deeply trained, and willing to take on foreigners. And the Japanese people themselves are, are not particularly interested, most of them, in Zen practice. They feel it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. And why should they bother? And I think there's a great deal of further interest in, in making a, a, a good living and having a good future in society. And society has always been uh, primary of primary importance in the Japanese culture. In the individual is not the important part. In America, of course, individualism is, is king or queen. And um, that leads to, to its own challenges for Zen practitioners who are Americans. But, one of the advantages we have is our um, willingness to, to explore, willingness to look in lots of different directions. Not everybody is uh, open to that, but uh, many of us are, and that's what is important in Zen practice. So Kala Rinpoche used to come periodically to Santa Fe to teach his students who were there and he would give public talks, usually one public talk each time he came. And we would go and listen. And they were inspiring. There's something about the way that Tibetan Buddhists teach that is uh, readily understandable, easy to understand, easy to communicate somehow. And, and um, we weren't as I said, we were quite inspired. Back in those days, both we and the Tibetan group were uh, trying to establish uh, temples in Santa Fe. And we used to go and attend each other's um, meetings at the Extraterritorial Zoning Commission and support each, other, each other's groups in our, in our aims. The Tibetan group actually was successful. And there is a Tibetan stupa uh, that the Dalai Lama himself has visited out on Airport Road in Santa Fe. It's, it's out in the edge of Santa Fe. Uh, as far as uh, Rochester Zen Center, uh, it wasn't karmically ripe yet to locate in Santa Fe. And eventually, um, the person who was actually most instrumental in bringing uh, Kapla Roshi to the United States, to Rochester to teach, Ralph Chapin, had a country property that was quite extensive. It's uh, 162 acres or something like that of beautiful land in Northern uh, New York State. 
and it is the site of an old uh, mill. I don't know what they milled back then, probably flour from, from wheat or something. But at any rate, the mill wheel is still there. The mill house is still there. The mill creek is still there. Uh, the pond that feeds the mill creek is still there. And Ralph, as he got older and older, knowing that Roshi Keplo had a dream of having a con country property and that it had not yet come to fruition, despite many efforts, donated it just before he died to the Rochester Zen Center uh, on condition that his daughter uh, was able to use the third floor, the upper floor of the mill house until she, she died. And that was, that was a harmonious uh, bequest. His daughter was, was familiar with Rochester Zen Center. Sometimes she would actually come and sit. And uh, Ralph, of course, is the person who, when he was, uh, I don't know whether he was living in Japan or visiting, I think he was visiting in Japan, came upon Roshi Kaplo, who at the time was no longer living in a temple, but was still training with Yastani Roshi, and had just written the three pillars of Zen. And when he made acquaintance with Kaplow, he found and spread about on the floor of the home that Kaplow and his wife uh, were living in, where the um, printer's proofs of the first edition of the Three Pillars of Zen. And he was given a set, <clears throat> took them back to the United States, and um, he, he was part of a very, very small group of um, wealthy New Yorkers who uh, lived in Rochester, who were studying Vedanta. And they invited, on the basis of the Three Pillars of Zen, they invited Roshi Kaplo to settle there, establish a center, and teach them. And so he did. And Ralph was, well, there's one last remaining member of that original group, which also, by the way, included Chester Carlson, who invented Xerox, the Xerox machine, um, still alive. And that was someone who was quite a bit younger than the others. And, and she finally died um, just a couple of years ago in her 90s. But in those days, Roshi was not enthusiastic about, and he was following the whole uh, uh, Japanese teachings at the time of uh, if you start training with a teacher, you do not go to another teacher. That's how it is in Japan. Um, it's somewhat looser in the United States. Uh, it also, you just stick with the specific teachings of your teacher. And that was Kaplan uh, way of teaching as well. And perhaps for some good reason, because there was at least one uh, Japanese teacher teaching in the United States who was kind of inventing koans and who also uh, stated to his students that he didn't feel that Americans had the capacity to come to awakening. Well, uh, many, many people have proved him wrong since then, but Kepler Rishi was interested in teaching in his own deep way, and it was a very deep way. And it has proven to be continuing a very deep way uh, continued by his successors. So we did find inspiration in Kala Rinpoche's teachings, in the simplicity, in the clarity of those teachings, and they inspired us in our own Zen practice. So I'd like to share again from this book, as I said, Luminous Mind, which is a description of our true nature.
This is under the um, heading of Mind's Three Bodies. Natural mind has a quality of clear transparency. Natural mind has a quality of clear transparency. And it was in that mind state that, uh, that um, when confronted with the, the irate grandparents of, uh, of a baby that was born out of wedlock, uh, that Hakuin's, great, uh, Hakuin's grandfather in Zen, that was his mind state through deep practice, luminous transparency. And it was because of that comprehension of that, of that mind, that recognition of that mind, that experiencing of that mind, that he was able to respond in the way he did and not get uh, furious, upset, uh, wigged out, um, irate, all the other things that many people would have done under the same circumstances. Natural mind, has a quality of clear transparency in which its three essential aspects exist spontaneously, emptiness, clarity, and unimpededness. We're not blocked by feelings. We're not blocked by ideas. We're not blocked by conditioning. We are free. That is our natural state of mind and we can open to that and people have opened to that over uh, millennia. Mind's transparency is its essential emptiness. Its knowing and luminous nature is its clarity. And the aspects of its enlightened experience are its unimpededness. When mind is in this state of limpid transparency, open and lucid, it is fully aware in a state of bare awareness, rigtong in, in Tibetan. It is pristine awareness, rigpa in Tibetan, unimpeded, experiencing in itself its limitless manifestations in all their aspects. This empty awareness, clear and unlimited, is not far from us. It is our actual face. But like our own face, it cannot perceive itself. And Zen it said, it's closer than our own eyes. It is who we are. And we can realize it. And the depth to which we realize this unimpeded, empty, lucid transparency determines how we are able to move forward in our life. A Kensho experience is a, a glimpse of this. And Kensho can be deepened. It can rarely be deep right from the beginning, but most of the time it's, it's rather shallow. It's, it's enough to be able to start working on subsequent koans, which help to, uh, expand our awareness, deepen our understanding. This empty awareness, clearer and unlimited, is not far from us. It is our actual face. But like our own face, it cannot perceive itself. This is what we call ignorance, or marigpa in Tibetan which is simply absence of bare awareness or rigpa. In order to get beyond ignorance, we have to see its empty nature without conceptualizing. Then we must accustom the mind to this experience and gradually stabilize it so that it remains free from distraction under all circumstances. This is how practice progresses. Let me read that again, it's vital. In order to get beyond ignorance, we have to see its empty nature without conceptualizing. And our, our mind naturally conceptualizes, but 
we can reach a, a state of mind where we are choosing not to conceptualize, where we're allowing ourselves to be simply profoundly present. And as we work deeper and deeper into our zazen, we become more and more able to do this. He goes on a little bit later on in a little bit more detail about this. This is how practice progresses. But remember that these essential qualities of mind are not anything we have to try to produce. They are mind's very nature, and we have only to recognize them. The mind being naturally empty is forever the Dharmakaya, the body of emptiness of the absolute body of the Buddha. Being naturally lucid, it, it is also the Sambhogakaya, the complete enjoyment body of Buddha. And since it is naturally unlimited knowledge, it is forever the Nirmanakaya, the manifestation body of the Buddha. So mind is always by nature the three bodies of the Buddha, naturally and spontaneously free. Naturally and spontaneously free. And of course, um, many of us will say, uh, what? Free? Naturally and spontaneously free? How come my mind is so full of thoughts? How come I get stuck? going around and around and around in a feeling or an idea. That doesn't feel very free to me. And of course it's not. That's the conditioned reflex of the mind. And a certain amount of it is there uh, in seeming protection to avoid feeling this luminous transparency, which can make us feel uh, initially, as if we have no ground under our feet. This is why he spoke of, of accustoming the mind to that awareness. So mind is always by nature the three bodies of the Buddha, naturally and spontaneously free. Nothing could possibly be done to improve their perfection. The realization of Mahamudra is called innate primordial awareness because the three aspects of mind's essential nature, emptiness, clarity, and unobstructiveness or unimpededness always exist in it. They are innate. And again, that is who we are. It's covered up by conditioning. And if we've been traumatized, even more so. But we can access it. And the next section is called Integration and Transmutation of Thoughts and Emotions. When we're just beginning to practice, our mind bubbles and effervesces like a pot of boiling water over a fire. The practice of rum, Bob, whatever that is, teaches us to stop interfering with thoughts and emotions, which is like ceasing to feed the fire. Then the boiling will stop on its own. And, and the extended out breath and the work on opening again and again and again to uh, a, an, a, a deep presence that is profoundly aware so that we're not trying to get rid of thoughts. This is important. We're not trying to change our mind into some form that is so-called enlightened. It's already there. It's about uncovering it. And so we observe. Our mind naturally thinks. That's one of the wonderful functions of our brain, that we are able to think. We are able to conceive of situations, of things. We are able to consider the future and remember the past, although there's a lot of research going on now that is showing us that this so-called past that we so-called remember has been influenced from the get-go by every single thing that has 
come between that and it, our, our, our reminiscence of it, so that there's all sorts of evidence that memory is not as um, dependable as we had been left to believe it is. And so the more reason to, to live in the moment and to be as open and free and clear that the moment's unfolding, naturally we understand how to move through. When we are living out of our conditioning, which of course can be, can be helpful. In fact, conditioning has a purpose. Uh, we stick our hand in a, in, a, in a fire and it burns and we don't do it again. It keeps us safe. But there's a lot of conditioning that keeps us trapped. And that's the conditioning that we're we, working to see through so that we can understand how it came about and understand that it may or may not be uh, useful and effective anymore and become free of it so that it's not driving our behavior. Continuing. The practice teaches us to stop interfering with thoughts and emotions, which is like ceasing to feed the fire. Then the boiling will stop on its own. So we're aware of thoughts, but we don't try to not think. And we also don't chase after them. And that's the challenge, not to chase after them. As beginners, we cannot remain for very long in a state of correct meditation. We're distracted by the thoughts and emotions that we fixate on and uh, cling to. We learn, though not to follow them, simply noting the presence of a thought. We do not follow after it, but instead remain alert in a state of detached observation of everything that appears to the mind as if we were a, a reporter from this world and we find ourselves suddenly on a very strange and new and different planet, that nothing is the same as it is back in our world. And so being a reporter, we're looking to observe without judging so that we can report back to our homeland uh, accurately what's what the, the, the description of that new planet. And it's like that with our practice. We, we become aware sometimes uh, with sinking heart of things about our, our workings of mind, things about our, our behavior and so on. But to open and offer radical acceptance is the way to work with that. Anything else is, is remaining caught in those habit patterns. And what we work towards is free ourselves from habit patterns so that we can freely comprehend the moment as it is. And with that clear comprehension and no drag on it, uh, because of an investment in a, in a past or a future or a self-image, we can naturally discern how to respond in each moment. This is built in. The more we let go, the more we allow ourselves to be fully present in a, an, in a non-judgmental, open, aware way the more we open to the innate freedom that we are, and the more we are able to move freely in appropriate directions without having to think them out, without having, having to know ahead of time how to behave. We learn not to follow them, simply noting the presence of a thought, 
We do not follow after it, but instead remain alert in a state of detached observation of everything that appears to the mind. We leave the mind as it is to recognize what is going on within it, and we do not interfere. Simply seeing, quote unquote, as we just described, is the state of the detached observer. When we remain in this state of uninvested vigilance, uninvested vigilance, as an impartial witness, thoughts and passions arise and disappear in emptiness, like waves arising and falling back in the sea, or like a rainbow that lights up and stretches across space. In this state of mind, all the thoughts and emotions that arise are no longer either beneficial or harmful. If we can practice this way, whatever rises in our mind will not be a problem. And we will be able to live in a state of continuous meditation in all circumstances. Staying in meditation throughout everything we do, whether praying, reciting mantras, or moving around, working, or sleeping, is what is called continual practice. All the accomplished masters of the past followed the same path. In true realization of Mahamudra, the afflictions adorn the mind rather than disturbing or contaminating it. Negative tendencies are no longer something to reject. They transmute themselves into primordial awareness. And then he goes on to speak a little bit about uh, working with emotions, such as intense desire and anger. He says, it is possible without either expressing or repressing anger to experience its essence, the dynamic clarity of mind, and to develop the realization of clarity void. What is true of desire and anger is also true of pride, envy, and the other mental afflictions, which become transformed through the same meditation. And now I'd like to share from a book called, effectively, You Are the Eyes of the World. And these are the teachings of Long Champa, who was also a Tibetan master uh, in the 10th century, I believe. And here he very specifically speaks on how to work with uh, emotions and difficult feelings. And I have to say that this method is extremely effective, but it takes practice. It takes a great deal of practice. And the more tenacious and the more painful or troubling these feelings are, the greater amount of practice it takes. But be patient. You will be amazed at the results. It's titled, The Passions Are Intrinsically Freed. Though attachment, aversion, dullness, pride, and envy may arise. And that, as I said, includes every, every challenging emotion. Fully understand their inner energy. Recognize them in the very first moment before karma has been accumulated. In other words, tune in to the energy of these sensations in your body rather than escaping into ideas, thoughts, or action. Tune in immediately as you begin to feel this sense of whatever it is, anger starting to rise or I mean, anger is, is a relatively easy one because it's so powerful. Tune in, feel the energy in your body. And if you stay tuned in to that energy, curious, aware, just experiencing the energy, you will not feel compelled to act out on it. Let's continue this. Recognize them in the very first moment before karma has been accumulated. In the second moment, look na nakedly at this state and relax in his presence. 
look nakedly at the state of a sensation in your body that if you think about it or escape into your head about it, you will recognize it as anger and you will feel it as something that you want to get rid of, you want to act on, you want to get out of. But if you do this, this way of experiencing and tune in right there, it gives you space in which to discern clearly and without attachment how to respond. Sometimes you recognize that, for example, with anger, it's just conditioning. Somebody has said something or done something that is bumped into your old self-image. And so you're uh, starting to get reactive about it. Tuning in, you recognize under those circumstances naturally that simply feeling this is allowing it to dissolve and you, you're free. You don't have to act. At other times when there's something important enough to act on, uh, in tuning in, you take yourself out of the picture in a sense. You take your conditioning, your habit patterns, your idea of self-defense and all the rest of it out of the picture. And what comes forth through that presence is an understanding of how to move next. And in my experience, it's always right. It may not be the way you think you wanted to move or what you thought you wanted to do, but it always turns out exactly right. And it's seamless and it works. So let's continue. Let's, let's start all over again, because this is incredibly important. This is, this is a serious road to freedom from our afflictive emotions. Though attachment, aversion, dullness, pride, and envy may arise, fully understand their inner energy. Recognize them in the very first moment before karma has been accumulated. In the second moment, look nakedly at the state and relax in its presence. Then, whichever of the five passions arise becomes a pure presence, freed in its own place, without being eliminated. It emerges as the pristine awareness that is clear, pleasurable, and not conditioned by thought. Clear, pleasurable, and not conditioned by thought. When we hear this, it may be hard to recognize that, to assume that that is even possible with something as, as potent as anger, but it is. And when we practice it and master the ability to work in that way, which basically is tuning into the felt sense, then it is amazing. It's liberating. And we don't go on to create negative karma. It's deep practice. It's the movement of this luminous awareness, this unimpededness of our true mind, and we can recognize it and we can live it. And our practice is the way to do that. Tuning in, working with the extended out breath and, and its innate curiosity and increasing presence. And we begin to uncover where we're caught and then we can work with it in this way. And it is marvelously effective. And I'm sure that that's how Shiro Bunan got to where he got, that he could be so free 
even in the midst of a, a very challenging period of his life. Brought on by something that somebody else created had nothing to do with him. He only became the scapegoat. But eventually he was freed from that as well. He, he actually was free right from before it happened. His practice had gone deeply enough. His awakening was profound enough. His transformation through the, uh, the long maturation, which is where we work steadfastly to let go of our stuff once we see it and we let go of it in exactly the way that was just uh, expressed through presence, through awareness, and through the felt sense. It's an incredible gift to be able to practice in this way and to begin little by little, millimeter by millimeter, sometimes mile by mile, to realize its potential. And of course, this is quite ongoing. If the Buddha could remember six pre previous lives when he was working to open and deepen and come to awakening before that final life where he actually had that profound awakening. And even in that final life, that there were many years of a challenging practice before it happened, it doesn't matter how long it takes. That we're on the path is what's most important because the path is liberating. First, it shows us where we're caught and then it sets us free. I thank you for listening. I'll stop now and recite the four vows.